Welcome to the latest edition of the MIT Sloan Expert Series, which brings you an inside look at some of the most exciting new ideas and research coming out of MIT Sloan. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. Joining me today on the program are Simon Johnson and Jonathan Gruber. They are the authors of a new book, Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive in Economic Growth and the American Dream. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Simon and John. Great and to be here. Before I begin, I want to remind our viewers that we will be taking questions live from you on social media. Please go to Twitter or Facebook and use the hashtag MIT Sloan Experts to pose your questions to Simon and Jonathan. So let's dig in. Uh, first of all, congrats on the book. It's a, it's a great read. Thanks so much. The premise is that scaling up publicly funded science can help jumpstart the growth engines that powered the post-war economy and importantly increase uh, participation in the benefits of that growth. I want to start by asking why this book and why now, Jonathan? Uh, this book really grew out of both Simon and my dissatisfaction with the fact that neither political party seemed to have a really constructive pro-growth agenda. I think we realized that while there's a lot of need for redistribution in America, to really solve the problems of broad prosperity, you need to actually grow and that we decided to start thinking about how we could get America growing faster again and realize the lessons were in our, were in our own history. Simon? Yeah, ab absolutely, Rebecca. Some of the headline numbers that we see about the economy are, are good or, or even quite good, but there's a lot of people, most people are frustrated. They're, they're scared, they've got anxieties, they're worried about the future of their kids. They feel that the number of good jobs that are really available to them are dwindling. And it doesn't have to be that way. It wasn't this way in the past in the US. And we're absolutely able, if we make the right kind of investments, to find a better path with more good jobs and higher growth and spread that across all parts of the country. So Simon, let's, let's delve a bit into the history of science and technology funding in the United States. Uh, talk a little bit, uh, paint, paint the picture for our viewers about what led up to America's leadership in this area, the, the events that led up to well, that. America's obviously been an innovative economy since, since the very beginning. However, in the 19th century, it was primarily an engineering economy. It wasn't very much into science. The, the leading places for scientific invention in the early 20th century even were Germany, France, and the UK. This changed primarily in World War II because top American scientists and political leaders realized that science had very practical military applications, and they were afraid that the US was going to fall behind and that Germany, frankly, was, was going to take over the world potentially. So there were big investments that came out of that, an enormous push, completely bipartisan, absolutely no difference between Republicans and Democrats on this for decades. The Cold War and the, the experience of watching the Russians launch the first Sputnik further made it clear that if you invest in basic science, if you figure out how to apply that science to, to government projects and also to commercial endeavors, you can build all kinds of new things, uh, jet aircraft, digital computers, incredible breakthroughs in, in pharmaceuticals. That really drove the US economy in the 50s and 60s, and then we ran out of steam. And for reasons we go into in the book, there was a loss of political will, there was a loss of economic uh, impetus there, a and the point of writing the book is to say, hey, we can go back to something like what we had before, of course, applied to the modern context. Right. So, so Jonathan, Simon has really painted this picture of how, uh, of how this investment really powered this, this economic growth. So what did happen? What went wrong? What went wrong was really three things. First of all, I think, quite frankly, it was the fact that we got overconfident. Scientists got overconfident to the point of thinking we would have a nuclear pen. Um, and we didn't really pay enough attention to the downsides of things like radiation poisoning and DDT, as Rachel Carson pointed out in her famous book, Silent Spring. The second thing that went wrong is the politicians and the scientists started disagreeing. We all had a common enemy, be it Germany or the Russian space program, we could all agree. But then the, science, the politicians started to want to do stuff that wasn't scientifically sensible, like a supersonic jet aircraft. The scientists said no, and the politicians got mad. And as we say in the book, when you speak truth to power, power will cut your funding. And that's what happened. Um, and the third thing was we started getting to budget pressures. Uh, the Vietnam War, the expansion of the Great Society, and then eventually leading to the anti-tax revolution under Reagan. And even post the Great Recession under Obama and now Trump, there's been a massive decline. So the share of GDP that goes to publicly financed R&D peaked at 2% of our entire economy in 1964, by far the highest in the world. We're down to 0.7% about 10th in the world. And so we, we now have s a, a, such a decrease in federally fin financed uh, R&D. Why can't the private sector pick up the slack? 
Well, the, the key point you have to understand, the private sector has to lead. The private sector has to be the engine of growth. But the private sector companies are interested in innovation and invention to the extent it increases their own bottom line. The problem is real scientific breakthroughs have huge spillovers. They benefit many parties. Um, and the problem is the private sector isn't interested in investing in inventions that have spillovers. Um, at the same time, new companies that want to start and do innovative science need financing. Now, we have a vibrant venture capital sector in this country that's financed many of the tech giants of our economy, but it's not a sector that's well set up to finance capital-intensive, long-investment new companies in clean energy or in deep biological sciences. So we need the financing to help those companies get started as well. And this is really getting at the heart of your proposal, Simon, and that is a significant uh, increase in, in R&D. Tell our viewers a little bit more about the plan. Well, well, first of all, I would emphasize we're very pro-private sector. We, okay. we like private sector. We like private Fair enterprise. Enough. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at MIT, among other things. Um, but the private sector can't do it by itself. The comp it's the complementarity between the public investment and the private initiative. That's what made the U.S. so successful and what spread the benefits so widely in the 1950s, 1960s, and less subsequently. So we are recommending large scaling up of public investment support for R&D. There's lots of good ideas. We put some forward in, in, the, in the book, and we'll talk about them with, with you in a minute. We want the book to actually start a conversation about areas of science that could benefit from public investment and where you would have these kinds of spillover effects. But we would do caution not to just put the money into the existing most intense hubs like around MIT or around Stanford, for example. These places are already very crowded. These places have a lot of congestion. There are many other parts of the United States that would do really well as tech hubs. In fact, we think they're almost there, many of them. We have a, hundred, a list of 102 potential tech hubs in our book. And while we're making these investments and we're being strategic and thinking about the geographic advantages of the U.S. in this sense, let's also think about ways to structure those public investments so there's an upside, like the rise in real estate prices when you build a new tech hub. Let's get some of that revenue to come back, not necessarily to the government, actually to the people, to the individuals, so you get a cash dividend, we call that an innovation dividend, a upside participation in the next tech boom. Wouldn't that be interesting and, and, and somewhat... And a way for Americans to share in the spoils of this, of this investment. Yes, absolutely. Look, in the 1940s, there was enormous promise of science. People thought they would gain in many ways, like you know, free electricity, for example, was dangled out by the nuclear power industry. That hasn't happened. Instead, what, we, what have we got is the loss of a lot of good middle-class jobs uh, from the advent of computers, uh, for example. It doesn't have to be the way. If you push hard on science and technology, you develop whole new industries. Those industries create jobs. Those are good jobs. The satellite industry, for example, which we built in this country, okay, in reaction to the crazy Russian threat, in part, yes, but also because it was good science and because there were a lot of constructive ways to apply that, that is a very good, solid employer. And we have a lion's share of satellite industry jobs in the world because we were first to that technology. Let's be first again and again and again, but that's only going to happen at this point with a scaled up public investment. And I want to talk a little bit about your ideas for, for, for selecting new hubs and, and, and more, more of that. But I want to go to, to Jonathan and, and talk a little bit about the, these compelling examples in your book, uh, where you show what can happen with an increase in public investment. One of the, one of the most compelling ones is the Human Genome Project. Yeah, I think a lot of people's reaction is, well, that was then, this is now. But actually, we have a very modern example in the book, which is that in 1975, two scientists uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering a way to uh, map the human genome, uh, to basically understand the genetic structure and actually open the promise of using in insights about the genetic structure to treat disease. Um, Fast forward to uh, the mid-1980s, one of those scientists wanted to actually propose to map the human genome, to literally say what is the biological construction of our whole body. Um, but there's no money in it, so the private sector wouldn't finance it. This is a Nobel Prize winner who'd started a successful company who wanted $10 million, couldn't raise it. Fortunately, the government set up the Human Genome Project to do exactly that, a 15-year project for $3 billion to map the human genome. Not a profitable enterprise, just a knowledge creation. Finished two years ahead of schedule. Fast forward to today. Today in the US, we have a genomics industry that has generated $1 trillion in economic output, which has paid in one year alone, pays twice as much in taxes as we actually paid to set up the Human Genome Project. This is the kind of success story we can have in America if we actually take 
the leadership role that Simon spoke about. There's other, there's, and, then, and the human genome is, is obviously the one of the most prominent examples, but there are other ones too, iRobot. Yeah, the, a really fun example for us. Once again, we think military R&D, we think waste. Those of us who grew up in the Reagan years think about $400 hammers being paid for by the Defense Department. But military R&D can be very productive. Our, our, one of our colleagues, John Van Rienen, has written an excellent paper showing that more military R&D leads to more jobs and more growth. And we have a great example in our book, which was a company uh, called iRobot, which had a military contract to build a minesweeper, an automated minesweeper. They did it and realized, gee, this might make a pretty good vacuum. Thus, the Roomba. The Roomba, which now uh, it controls 20% of the entire world vacuum market, was created out of a military application. There's now a thousand jobs in America created by the fact that iRobot is uh, producing the Roomba. I want to go back to something you were talking about earlier, Simon, and that is the, the, these, these parts of the country that really need a jump start. So what in your book, you lay out a plan for how we could potentially give them a jump start. Can, Talk a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I want to be very clear that there's nothing about, nothing of charity in this. It's strategic. And it's thinking, okay, what are the advantages that the U.S. has? Great, deep technical talent. What are the somewhat slight disadvantages? Well, a lot of that talent is concentrated in a few places. It's very expensive to live in those places. It takes a long time to get to work. There's enormous other congestion costs. And if you were to, to propose scaling up Boston, for example, well, there's a lot of people stuck in traffic jams right now who wouldn't be so happy about that. But we have a lot of technical talent. We have really good living conditions, we have a lot of uh, population in other places. And so what we, what we do in the book, and we have a, a website where people can explore this for themselves, is we show you the various characteristics of cities in the east, near the East Coast, in the Midwest, but also further west, and a lot of uh, great opportunity in the South, for example. And we suggest that if you look at population, if you look at technical talent, if you look at the amount of innovation going on right now, if you link the, these places to, to universities in particular, those great uh, undergraduate science universities in almost every part of the country, you can have, you do have, all the elements for a hub, but you haven't yet reached critical mass. You don't quite have enough for people to say, yes, this is the place where we're going to move, this is the place where we're going to have the next wave of, of, of breakthrough innovation. That's where the public investment comes in. And that's why we propose actually run a competition. Let's do an Amazon-type competition, remember the Amazon HQ2 I competition, do but not trying to get the biggest tax breaks, on the contrary, trying to get the biggest co-investment, smartest co-investment from local and state government with the agreement of their communities, including with affordable housing, including with the right kind of investment in schools, and including with an upside that can come back to, to all Americans as an innovation dividend. Let's run that competition and, and really tap into this technical talent that we have all, all across the country. And this, you say, will uh, address the fundamental problem of rising inequality in this country. Well, we have rising inequality along many dimensions. There's been an enormous attention to rising inequality along the income dimension. I think less attention has been paid to rising geographic inequality, which is that essentially there's a set of small set of superstar cities that are pulling away from the rest of the country. So the top 10 highest earning cities in America have earnings which are 60% higher than the average city in America. They also have house prices which are 300% higher than the average city in America. These places are pulling away, but people can't take advantage of those opportunities because they can't afford to move there, partly due to geographic constraints. I mean, Boston, we have an ocean on one side, partly due to housing rules where people live there don't want to build that much housing. Palo Alto, they like their low-slung single-family houses that are worth $5 million. They don't want to change that. The answer is not to try to keep shoving people into these cities, which is unsuccessful. The answer is to recognize there are enormous opportunities around the country. And we identify them in the book. We have a suggested list, not just suggested list, it's one set of criteria, of 102 places that basically could meet the criteria for being the tech hubs of tomorrow. But they're not going to get there by themselves. Look, did anyone honestly think Amazon was going to choose anywhere other than one of these big cities on the coast? No, because they are the current modern tech hubs. But if the government said we are committed to creating these technology hubs in partnership with universities and the private sector, just like we did uh, in the wake of World War II, then that could mean these new places can grow. This is great. Uh, this is actually a great time also to talk to another expert, to bring in another expert. The MIT Sloan Expert Series recently sat down with Eric Brynjolfsson, another professor here at MIT Sloan and the co-author of The Second Machine Age. Here is what he had to say about how America can regain its innovation mojo. There is a secret to economic growth, and Bob Solo here at MIT helped discover that and that is technological innovation. Some of the really big investments in what economists call general purpose technologies 
that affect many, many different industries often don't have adequate incentives from the private sector for innovation. And so Economics 101, basic textbook economics, says that there's a role for government to make those kinds of investments. That's something that America understood better than probably any other country on the planet, especially in the years during and after World War II, when so many of the wonderful inventions that we have today were first developed. One of the things that Gruber and Johnson have pointed out is that we can get back our innovation mojo if we rediscover what drove those innovations in the past, and that is a robust private and public partnership. Innovation is one of the few free lunches that economists can identify. It not only creates wealth and growth, but if done right, it can also create shared prosperity. One of the things I like about Gruber and Johnson's blueprint is that they identify a way of investing in these innovations in places that have historically been struggling. And so if we not only boost innovation, but do it in some of the less developed parts of the country, some of the parts of the country that have been keeping up, we can get a win-win of boosting growth but also leading to more shared prosperity. One of the things that troubles me is that not just investment innovation, but also the public attitude towards science innovation have changed over the past 20, 30 years. Famously, when John F. Kennedy pointed us towards the moon landing, everyone was inspired, and I think it led to a whole generation of people deciding to go into science and technology, and we're all wealthier as a result. But today, many of the stories about science and technology are negative, about how there are fears, whether it's from nuclear power and nuclear weapons, biological abuses, artificial intelligence running amok. These are all things that I think are often legitimate concerns, but we shouldn't miss the forest for the trees. The big picture is that innovation creates vastly more wealth, opportunity. It can make us healthier and happier and better off. It can solve all sorts of different problems. What we need is more innovation, not less innovation. And that doesn't just depend on government investment. It also depends on the public's attitudes. Gruber and Johnson help us understand the power of innovation and the power of changing those attitudes. Ultimately, I think the best days of America and the world are ahead of us, not behind us. And I think we're very lucky to be living in an era where we have the possibility of making these kinds of enormous scientific and technological breakthroughs. That was Eric Brynjolfsson here at MIT Sloan. So he sounded very confident about the future of America. And one of the parts of your plan that you emphasize in the book is that this will create a lot of opportunity for a lot of different kinds of people, not just the folks with PhDs. That's right, Rebecca. That's very important because sometimes when you say spend money on science, people say, oh, yeah, well, that's good for people with PhDs or people who work at MIT. But remember, in the post-war period, that's what created good jobs for everyone, including people who only had a high school education or didn't actually complete high school. So when you build this infrastructure for science, which is what we're proposing, you create a lot of jobs in and around both the construction and then the operation of science. Now that's a really key point. Moving those jobs, shifting the emphasis of the growth away from the megacities is also going to help because a lot of people who haven't yet finished, who haven't finished college are getting pushed out of the big cities because they're not, it's, it's too expensive to live there. So sharing the opportunities around the country and investing in science is going to create good jobs for everyone. And sharing, sharing the, the wealth in, in cities that are not the superstar megacities, one of the, there, there's a very interesting example in your book. It's a city you would not necessarily think of when you're talking about scientific innovation. Can you tell us a little bit about? Sure. So I'll ask a question. We'll, 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 let, the, we'll let the viewers see, see if they can get this. So the question is, what city in America is the home of the, the world home of the computer microsimulation industry and has one of the largest universities in America? I'll pause there. If you didn't guess it, you're not alone. Only one person of the roughly 300 I've asked have guessed it, and it's Orlando, Florida. How Orlando, Florida? Orlando, Florida, because Orlando, Florida had, through a political favor, a, a Navy base. What do you do with a landlocked Navy base? You do training. And one of the forms of training was battle simulation training. The University of Central Florida had an innovative president who bought 1,000 acres below the university, got the Navy to move their computer simulation center below the university, and set up a research park around it. Today, that Central Florida Research Park has 10,000 employees, and that area, 45 minutes east of or Disney World, it's not Disney World, East Orange County, has created 100,000 jobs in and around these industries over the last 30 years. That is a great example of what we can accomplish with partnerships between the government, universities, and the private sector. 
All right, so we're now gonna turn to social media and answer some questions that we've been getting from Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so here is one. Where exactly should we invest our public dollars with a view to generating new technologies that will create good jobs? Good question. So basically, I, one, one important statement, we don't claim to have all the answers in this book. Indeed, we think in many, ways, in many ways, <laughs> we raise more questions than answers. We want to get people talking about these issues. In the book, we suggest some areas, but we don't claim to be authoritative. We suggest some important areas. A great area is synthetic biology. This is essentially creating the lab, things that are created biologically in nature. A great success story is an artificial treatment for malaria, which has saved millions of lives. We have companies now that are making plastic bottles out of algae, so they decompose in a week instead of 10,000 years. We have all sorts of examples. We talk about a hydrogen-powered cars. We talk about exploring the deep sea. In every one of these examples, these are ideas that came out of American government-led investment where now the rest of the world has surpassed us because our investment's fallen off. Other countries are doing this. Other countries have learned this lesson. Other countries have read our history. Other countries are setting up research parks and research hubs where they are taking those next steps. Indeed, probably the most successful story of American R&D over the last 40 years has been medical R&D. We are now, the New England Journal, I believe, or JAMA, projects that within 20 years, China will now have the leadership in medical R&D in the world. That is ridiculous. We, our NIH has created modern medicine. We should continue to put that money in. Uh, another one, uh, what are your thoughts on the Green New Deal? <laughs> Tell me more about it. I need to know the details. But look, broadly, I, I think this is exactly the kind of conversation we should be having at this point, which is what, what does the world need? What kind of technology has to be invented? What is the private sector not going to do? If the private sector is going to do it, I'm all in favor of getting out of the way, but if they're not going to do it, and they clearly haven't solved some of our uh, green and energy issues, then it's absolutely ripe, uh, ripe for public sector investments. You have to break it down. You have to think about what are the pieces of technology that need to be developed? Where can we be developed? What do we build on? I don't think we, I think the conversation about green energy New Deal is very early stage, but I'm, I think it's extremely positive that this is the kind of idea that's on the table. That's what we want to do with the book. That's what we want to do with our public appearances and our media appearances, which is stimulate exactly this kind of discussion in a relatively detailed way. And hey, we're economists, so we want to know the cost benefits. We want to know how much you're going to spend and what kind of benefits you're going to get and how those benefits are going to come back to the American people. That's our question for the scientists and, and for the policymakers. Uh, next question, and this is what I think both of you, I'd like to hear you both weigh in on this. What will it take to galvanize the public around science and exploration, do we need another Sputnik moment? That is an excellent question that we discuss in the book. Clearly, having a moment like that does it, or, or the example of John Kennedy saying, let's get a man to the moon. The problem is, once he got a man to the moon, uh, it kind of killed, the, it, it kinda killed <laughs> the momentum on that. Uh, so I think we need to recognize that the motivation today needs to be as much internal as external. It does need to be external. We need to be motivated by the fact that we're losing our science leadership in the world. But that's vague. That's not a Sputnik. That's vague. I think the problems are internal. We need to recognize that we're dividing as a country. You can see it politically. You can see it economically. And the answer is not to just tax the rich and give to the poor, whatever your feelings are about that. The answer is to grow as an economy in an inclusive and broadly spread way. And the way to do that is to recognize that only happens through productivity increases through being more productive as a society. And productivity comes from science and comes from research and development. And it comes from science leadership. As Simon mentioned, because we are first to satellites, we now have more than half the satellite jobs in the world. Because we led in genomics, we now have most of the genomics jobs in the world. We need to lead on those next frontiers. And that's how we will get people excited. And the last point uh, that Simon mentioned as well, we need a proposal that feels inclusive. Not, oh, some eggheads at MIT want to do more research, but, oh, we want to do research in a way which can bring back areas which have the preconditions for success but haven't thrived and which shares the benefits with all Americans. I mean, one of the things that you had talked about in your book is that there was a point in time where so many Americans felt that science was good for them, and that has fallen away. Yes, I, I think science in, in, in those early days, 1940s, 1950s, was relatively uncomplicated. It, it had a great deal of promise. The benefits were going to be shared uh, very broadly. Uh, if you like uh, science fiction and, and television, I, I recommend the early Star Trek episodes, <laughs> sort of showing this, this very starry-eyed uh, version of the future. Uh, it's not, obviously, the world is more complicated, and science has unintended consequences, and you've got to be careful about the sort of investments you make. We've learned that, uh, for example, with regard to, to pesticides uh, industry, but also the nuclear industry. Uh, 
However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't invest. On the contrary, you should invest, and you should invest in, and think about the risks and think about the issues and, and, and make that part of the agenda and part of the conversation with the public. I think everyone in the United States is pro-science, and everyone wants more science, but they want to understand it. They want to be involved. They want to think about the consequences. They want a conversation. They don't want to be talked down to about the science. And, and I think our book is helpful and it should be helpful and seen as helpful in that way because we want to turn those scientific investments into jobs, jobs that really help everyone. And if you look at the history, I think the, the key lessons that we learn is you need to depoliticize the science, which we propose to do by setting up a what we call an innovation commission. One of the most successful political examples of the last 40 years is what's called the Base Closing Commission. It's really hard to close military bases. A lot of jobs get lost. So Congress set up an outside commission which recommended a list of bases to close. Remember House of Cards season one, they talked about this. And then Congress voted on an up or down basis on that list. We, we propose a hub opening commission that depoliticizes it. That's one important thing. But the other important thing is, you know, Simon more than I poured over thousands of pages in history. No one ever talked about the economic benefits of science. It was about the scientific, the knowledge benefits. But the economic benefits, as we document in our book, are huge. We estimate that if the US government invested $100 billion a year in R&D, we could create 4 million jobs. Okay? Now, arson may not be precise. It may not be exactly right. But it's in the right ballpark. And the point is people need to talk more about how science is a pro-jobs policy. Final question, and then this actually plays into a lot of what you're saying. Has the relationship between scientists and policymakers changed irrevocably in light of the current political climate? Uh, you know, I don't think it's irrevocable. Certainly the political climate is bad, but let's be honest, the political climate was pretty bad in the past too. So in the early 1970s, when President Nixon wanted to create an anti-ballistic missile system, which made no sense scientifically, and scientists protested, he didn't hire, he fired a science advisor. So this has happened before. We've seen this before. I, I think it's not unresolvable, but I think what we have to do is for the scientists need to recognize that the answer is not just to say we're smarter than you are. The answer is to say that science benefits all of us and it benefits people outside just Cambridge and, and San Francisco and it benefits through more good jobs for everyone. Behind closed doors, people across the political spectrum are in favor of some version of this idea. I'm not saying they're coming out to endorse our book right away, but investing in science, supporting the scientific future of America, no disagreement about that. How that becomes public policy and how that gets articulated, how that becomes messages, how that's reflected in political campaigns, that's a different issue. We are working to make that into a constructive conversation across all dimensions of the political aisle. Well, Simon and Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. The book is Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. It comes out next week. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks so much for having us. And thank you for joining us on this edition of the MIT Sloan Expert Series. We will see you next time.